Rebecca Dolan from MassDEP and Carrie Sesportis from OTA, but there are other folks on the, the um, call here as well. And so uh, anyone will be piping up whenever they have something to add. So we'll, we'll try to keep it kind of informal. And we have some program updates for you today. So our agenda will be, we're gonna give you a quick refresher at the beginning on, on what our governing and advisory bodies are. And, and we have a document around decision-making to uh, just let you know about. Um, we'll give you an SAB update, talk about some Toro reporting changes, and uh, also mention some staffing changes at the agencies. And then each agency will um, share some things going on at their spot. And uh, then we're gonna have about 15 minutes at the end where we're gonna have a breakout uh, Q and A where you will get to choose uh, whichever agency you want to um, go meet with or talk to and ask questions of and just have a little uh, casual discussion. We're going to pretend you're at a round table at lunchtime asking questions. So uh, just to, again, a, sort of a quick refresher here, um, the governing and advisory bodies for the Tura program. Um, first of all, there's a science advisory board, which is sort of the so solid scientific underpinning of all our decisions, and they um, assist us. Tura manages that, but they assist us in what chemicals we might want to add to the list, we might want to take off the list, or we might want to make higher hazard substances, or um, any other work we have that requires sort of a deep dive into the science. Uh, we have an advisory committee that's a multi-stakeholder body, and they uh, bring all their various perspectives and assist us with what are the policy implications of any decision we might want to make. Uh, is the program you know, hitting the target? We just get a lot of varied input from them. And that input not only helps the program, but that goes to the administrative council. So that advisory committee is, is, is also serving the council. The council is our governing body. They're the ones that make decisions about whether we add a chemical or make a higher hazard, a lower hazard, or, or whether the program undertakes something in particular. They are our governing body. So they get policy input from the advisory committee and scientific input from the science advisory board, and uh, then lots of input from the program agencies, and then they will make decisions. And that decision-making process, um, is it's not... Uh, all laid out in the regs. So what we have is a, a document that kind of guides that process and describes how it works. And so um, there's a link to that document here. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to look at it. I know uh, there are folks on the advisory committee for that are TUR planners and represent that constituency or represent business constituencies. And so if there, we have folks on the um, this uh, training session that are on the advisory committee, I bet you've looked at it, but many of the rest of you may not have, so it might be interesting. Um, so uh, Heather's going to share a little bit about what's going on at the Science Advisory Board. Yeah, I'll update you guys on the things the Science Advisory Board has been working on for the past few years, actually. Um, so in 2021, the Science Advisory Board um, made a recommendation to list uh, 24 um, cast numbers of quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, we have an attorney has an associated fact sheet that, um, that will give you a little bit more helpful information about quaternary ammonium compounds in general. Um, since the Science Advisory Board's recommendation, Turi has developed a policy analysis um, as always, our policy analyses um, include a summary of the science from the Science Advisory Board, um, expected use in Massachusetts, alternatives that are available, other regulations that are in play, and overall expected impacts to the program. Those have been presented over the last couple of years at the Advisory Committee and the Administrative Council. Um, and the next slide is going to talk about the Administrative Council votes, um, so I'll leave that for next. Um, since we made that recommendation in 2021, uh, we've been working on deliberations for carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers. The program received a petition um, to list those in 2020. Uh, so when, when we finished up with the quaternary ammonium compound work, we moved on to that. The Science Advisory Board has recommended listing single wall carbon nanotubes, multi wall carbon nanotubes, and carbon nanofibers. Um, the Science Advisory Board has also recommended designating multi wall carbon nanotubes as higher hazard substances. And they have voted to put um, single wall carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers on the Science Advisory Board's more hazardous chemical list. The more hazardous chemical list 
is a non-regulatory informative list. Um, so there would be no additional regulatory action associated with that. And then finally, since we um, since we finished up the work on carbon nanotubes and nanofibers just a couple of months ago, uh, we have been working on flame retardants in relation to the new flame retardant law that was passed and signed by Governor Baker in 2020, um, an act to protect children, families, and firefighters. That law um, bans 11 chemicals um, from certain products. And um, it says that the Science Advisory Board must consult with MassDEP or MassDEP must consult with the Science Advisory Board um, regarding the addition of additional chemicals um, to that law. So the Science Advisory Board has been working on consulting with MassDEP on that um, for the last several meetings. Um, wanted to remind everybody the Science Advisory Board meetings and materials. Um, the Science Advisory Board meetings are um, open public meetings. Um, you are always welcome to attend and it can be kind of an informative um, process, although it can be a, can be a, a dense uh, process as well. The meeting minutes are always on Turi's website. Materials for the meetings are on the website too, so you can stay informed that way if you're interested. Hey, thank you. Um, and just to note, uh, if you have questions, you can stick them in the chat and uh, or just note that you have a question and maybe when we get to the end of this kind of overview, program overview before we go into the agency updates, we'll uh, stop and take a, um, questions if there are any. Um, so real quickly, yeah, uh, Heather mentioned the Administrative Council um, have a meeting. They did vote in August to uh, start the public participation process for both the EPA TRI additional chemicals and also quaternary ammonium compounds. The EPA TRI additional chemicals, which you'll hear about in a minute, are kind of automatically added. So that process has already gone forward and the quaternary ammonium compounds is in process. So with that, I think Carrie is gonna share some updates on uh, reporting and uh, program-wide stuff. Great, thanks Liz. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carrie Sassportis, and I'm the Outreach and Chemical Policy Analyst at OTA. Um, and first, I'd like to just give a brief update on our current regulatory package and, as Liz said, oh. the EPA changes to TRI reporting for PFAS, um, which will impact her reporting. Um, so just to set the context for this, I've added a reminder, which is in the blue box on the left-hand portion of this slide. Um, that toxic or hazardous substances that are added to the federal um, toxics release inventory or TRI list under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act or EPGRA um, are required to be added to the TURA list by statute. And that um, TURA statute citation is, um, there's a link to that in the blue box. And then in the green box on the right hand side of the slide, there's a summary of the chemicals that have been recently added to the TRI list, and these will be added to the TURA list. So um, even though the TRI additions are required by TURA, we do go through a public participation process to update our TURA toxic hazardous substances list, uh, which is the regulation 301 CMR 41. Um, so this regulatory package consists of nine individual PFAS chemicals. Those will be reported like the other TFAS. Um, TRI PFAS at the 100 pound threshold. There's also a diisonyl phthalate category or DINP, uh, which will be at the standard TURA thresholds, um, 25,000 pounds manufactured or processed and 10,000 pounds otherwise used. Um, there are 12 additional chemicals. Um, 11 of those will be at the nor normal TURA thresholds. And then there's one chemical um, which has a very long name that's difficult to pronounce. Um, I can do that if folks have questions, but that will be at the 100 pound threshold. Um, and so for this regulatory package on November 3rd, we had held a public hearing for the TRI additions. Um, no verbal testimony was received, but we did get one written comment. The public comment period is now closed. So I'll just ask folks to stay, stay tuned for the final updates. Um, and this will be uh, expected for TUR tracking and reporting year 24 and reporting due in 2025. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this slide is just a high level overview of some of the key differences um, between TURA um, and the federal TRI regulation. Again, this is a likely review for most folks, if not everyone. 
um, but just sets the context for the next set of slides. So TURA is a state regulation, as you know, and TRI is federal. Um, the TURA regulation focuses on source reduction, and there's reporting annually to DEP on chemicals processed, manufactured, or otherwise used. Um, and the um, TURA list of toxic or hazardous substances is under the regulation um, 301 CMR 41, mm -hmm. um, which does include the TRI and CERCLA listings, as well as those listings specific to TURA. Um, so the TRI, the TURA list um, is larger than the TRI list. Um, and again, I mentioned these reminders just as a segue, um, segue to um, our next slide. Um, so folks may have heard that uh, recently EPA um, has finalized a rule to eliminate the de minimis exemption for PFAS reporting and supplier notification requirements under TRI. Um, so EPA has added PFAS substances that are subject to reporting under ECRA to a list of chemicals of special concern. Um, so folks go back to the TURA regulation. Um, this appears at 310 CMR 50, section 20 for TURA reporting. Um, you'll see that the TURA program follows the EPA de minimis exemption, but also note that the de minimis exemption does not apply for any toxic or hazardous substances that are considered a federal chemical of special concern, which these are now. Um, so the TRI listed PFAS, um, as I mentioned, already have a lower threshold of reporting at 100 pounds, um, but this listing of, of these PFAS as chemicals of special concern means that the use of the de minimis exemption is no longer available for these PFAS. Um, and because uh, the de minimis exemption is no longer available for supplier notification, um, it does mean that suppliers of mixtures and products containing these chemicals will be obligated to disclose the presence of PFAS. And I just want to summarize and clarify, because I know this gets confusion, confusing. So um, the elimination of the de minimis exemption for PFAS reporting and su supplier notification under TRI, um, that will take effect in the beginning of reporting year 2024, subject to reporting in 2025. Um, so this relates again to the 189 TRI PFAS that are listed on TURA at that 100 pound threshold. Um, and, and for those chemicals, the de minimis exemption will no longer apply, but also keep in mind that the PFAS, the other PFAS on the TURA list, for example, the certain PFAS NOL, still have those standard TURA thresholds um, and the de minimis exemption still applies. Um, so what we've done at OTA is we've prepared an updated supplier notification letter that reflects these changes. Um, and the link to the updated letter is posted on this slide. And I can also put that link in the chat in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go over this briefly. This slide's just a quick overview, um, summarizing the things I've just mentioned about PFAS tracking reporting under TURA and TRI. Um, so these last four rows in this um, table um, correspond to those 189 TRI PFAS that I just mentioned. Um, also to note that TRI continues to add to their PFAS. So additional um, PFAS will be added to the TRI list for future reporting years. Um, and this is due to the automatic addition of PFAS to the TRI list, which uh, was mandated in 2020. It's the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, so we know this is confusing. Chemicals are part of the TURA category um, uh, that get added, or there's there's chem TRI chemicals that get added um, to the TURA list at 100 pounds. So just stay tuned if you have questions. Also, please do reach out to us and later in the session we'll break out. So you also have the opportunity to ask uh, questions from the TURA program staff. Great. All right. Um... So maybe this is a good time to just take a quick stop. Uh, Pam, are there any uh, questions sort of about the program as a, as a whole or, or some of these changes in reporting or science advisory board or anything that uh, came in on the chat? Um, so Chris has asked for our, um, access to the list of quat compounds that we're looking at. And um, I didn't, I don't, I'm sure I didn't find the right spot. So, oh good, Heather just posted where you can go for that. Yeah, and that's on the, the fact sheet that Terry has, right, Heather? Hope you're muted. 
sorry, no, the fact sheet's not the best place to go for that. I have posted a link to the draft policy analysis on quaternary ammonium compounds. It was presented at the August um, 10th, 2023 meeting of the Administrative Council. So those, that document contains the list of quaternary ammonium compounds that was voted on. Thanks, Heather. That's yes. great. Um, did anyone else have any questions? I do. It's Lucy. Um, just to just to clarify again, Carrie, that the de minimis exemption for TRI takes effect in 2025 reporting? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, reporting year 2024 to track and reporting in 2025. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that will help everybody get more information from their suppliers. So use that updated supplier notification letter. And I have I have posted the slides. I just did it recently. So if you're already on our website where the slides get posted, just hit refresh, control R, and then you should be able to access it. Sorry about that. Thanks, Pam. Um, so it, we have some updates that if you have been more involved in the TUR program, you may have already seen, but some of you only uh, kind of uh, touch down once a year, so we're going to include them anyway. Um, there is some new leadership in the governor's office and in the secretariat, so uh, Rebecca, Te Rebecca Tepper is the new secretary at EEA, and Stephanie Cooper, who was at DEP before and is now the undersecretary for environment. We're very happy to have her in charge of the, the TURA program. She uh, is leading the administrative council. Um, and at Mass DEP, they have a new commissioner, um, Bonnie Heipel, and uh, she has great plans and, and, uh, and they're off and running. Uh, at UMass Lowell, we have a new chancellor as of last year, and that's uh, Julie Chen. She comes from the faculty ranks of plastics engineering up through the research. She was more recently vice chancellor for research, and, uh, and she is a great advocate for uh, the kind of work that you're all doing and, uh, and for innovation in general. So we hope for great things from all those folks. Um, at each of the agencies, we have some staff over the last year that have come on board. So at OTA, Alicia uh, Thoreen is, is a relatively new um, environmental engineer on their staff. And we also want to recognize the retirement of Jim Kane, um, who's a longtime environmental engineer with OTA, and he has uh, taken retirement and we wish him well. Um, Rebecca Dolan, who you may have heard from if you have been involved in uh, with DEP on any in, um, compliance issues, uh, is uh, now with the TUR program at DEP, and she's doing an awesome job. Um, at Turi, we have a number of new folks, or different faces at least. Um, Gabriel Salierno is our green chemist, and uh, we have a new person out front, um, uh, Stephen Ancy, and that's who Pam was telling you you should always call if you're on one of these uh, conferences and, and you need assistance. Um, Karen Thomas uh, worked at Turi many years ago and has come back to help us with some environmental health and safety stuff and has been working uh, a lot with Heather on the science advisory board work. Um, Katie Daly is our new communications and outreach person. And so uh, I bet you'll get to know her at some point. Um, and Alex Simcoe and Amelia Wagner are doing some work in the lab and also helping. Uh, Alex is going to be helping with some of the training work and Amelia helping with some of our other um, or policy oriented or science oriented work. So, so uh, please welcome all these folks and uh, hopefully in, in the spring you'll all come to the conference and get to meet everyone. Um, so uh, now we have some individual program agency updates. Um, so uh, we'll kick into those. And uh, again, a, a reminder is that we've kind of put an, an intro slide, an overview slide in front of each of these and remember what it is we all do and what kind of questions you might be queuing up to get into a breakout group. So um, at Turi, we do a variety of things. Um, we're located at UMass Lowell and we provide services to businesses and communities. Um, we're responsible for the education and training of TUR planners and love that part of our work. Um, we are responsible for some science and policy work. So we have the science advisory board and uh, we do policy analyses. Uh, we also are in, have a research arm. And so again, we have a new green chemist and we're doing some really interesting work in the laboratory and on alternative uh, solvents and alternatives for cleaning. Um, and so you'll hear a little more about those in a minute. 
And uh, we also provide uh, technical and financial support to businesses and communities through grants and information resources. Um, we also at various times have different uh, business supply chain work groups. So those are like a non-competitive space where everyone's getting together across the supply chain to solve problems. Um, this is just a brief overview of what Turi does. Um, I wanted to point out um, that last June, we had a Champions of Toxic Use Reduction event. It's something we used to do every year, but took a hiatus for the pandemic. So we had one this last June and uh, it was uh, a great event. And we had some uh, wonderful dignitaries, including our new undersecretary there and uh, our new commissioner of DEP and some legislators. And we uh, provided some uh, well-deserved uh, kudos to um, a number of groups. I'm gonna show you some of those in a minute. Also wanted to note it that the uh, governor declared it as champions of toxic use reduction day. So uh, going over some of those folks that got recognized at that event uh, allows me to highlight Turi's uh, three current strategic priorities. So we are focusing in on three things. One of them is the halogenated solvents. We really are trying to drive to zero. EPA's recent uh, decision that uh, TCE posed an unreasonable risk and needed to be banned in most uses will also be a good driver, but we're really trying to make sure we can help um, all companies uh, get rid of their halogenated solvents where possible. Um, we also are focused on PFAS for all the reasons you probably already know, and we're really looking at the uh, the safer alternative space for PFAS. On flame retardants, we kind of went back into the flame retardant space uh, because of the new flame retardant law and the work that uh, Turi and the Science Advisory Board have been doing to assist DEP with uh, determining what flame retardant should be covered under that law. But uh, also it's a great example of a chemical where in many cases it is not necessary. And you're going to see an example of that. So these are um, our champions that we recognized. So you'll see some of them focus on safer solvents. Um, S.E. Shires, it makes uh, just beautifully crafted uh, brass musical instruments um, and implemented an ultrasonic cleaning system. And again, we had a couple other facilities that have been working on safer solvents. And this is something that Turi and OTA have done a lot of work on um, across the Commonwealth. Um, the Conklin project is one where both Turi and OTA are working together and we've provided some grant fundings. And that, that's an example of a small business where the resources of the program really do um, you know, add up to progress where they might otherwise not be able to make progress. Um, we also have been working on PFAS in the safer alternatives uh, part. And so we had um, Professor Ram Nagarajan and his team work with Transcene company in Danvers, and they came up with um, some alternative non-fluorinated surfactants to, for use in their uh, etching products that they make for the electronics industry. Um, so I know that came up this morning in, in the group that I was in uh, as one of the issues where they're using uh, PFAS surfactants as wetting agents. And um, I think that was in photoresist and stuff, but this was a case where, where the uh, researchers and the research team managed to find some uh, already commercially available solvents, I mean, uh, surfactants that were suitable for that application. Um, and they've already been implemented. We worked also with Nantucket PFAS Action Group and the firefighter partners in Fall River Hyannis in Nantucket. And uh, that was focused on their firefighter turnout gear and also some general training for firefighters around PFAS. And they have made some uh, great progress there and also done a lot of research about exposure. Um, so here's the flame retardant example where uh, we have now um, supported several gyms in Massachusetts over the years to switch out their foam cubes uh, for non-flame retardant foam cubes because uh, we did a lot of work with uh, WPI and some fire researchers and found that they really weren't adding any substantial amount of, of flame resistance and it was not making enough difference to, to have um, children in with these um, highly toxic and endocrine disrupting chemicals in uh, which uh, tend to come off all these foam cubes. So uh, Denoma Gym is the most recent gym that, that uh, switched them out. And that's a great example of uh, the essentiality principle or it's not necessary, let's not use it. Uh, we have uh, 
we are in process of uh, distributing some grants this year as well. We have in the business uh, area, we have some for one for food processing and one for furniture manufacturing. In academic research, they're focusing still on PFAS, but now on textile and food packaging coatings. Uh, we also have a new um, uh, group in our nuclear sciences uh, division that is doing uh, what's called piggy analytical equipment. So that's a uh, like particle emission gamma X, uh, anyway, I'll say it later. <laughs> it's a new analytical technique that's great for detecting PFAS fast and easy. Um, so that is actually being combined with our community grants this year where we are making use of that equipment and trying to uh, collect some information and help folks understand both at small businesses and in uh, like in children's play spaces and in communities where those chemicals are being used. Pam, you want to say a bit about our training and education? Yes, I do. <laughs> we love, as, as Liz said, yeah, I mean, working with you guys um, is really so much fun and always something new. So we just wrapped up the last, um, the most recent TUR planner certification course. We had 16 people in class. We had several others who um, took the online only option. Um, and what I, I, I want to say is that, you know, more, what I have seen over the years is more and more companies sending their young staff typically to get this training so that they have, um, you know, really excellent on-site TUR planning. And I just think that's a really wonderful um, trend. And I encourage you all to really be looking at your staff and, and looking at sort of the next generation of leaders and, and who are you working with who you think could really benefit from becoming a toxics use reduction planner. And to that point, um, I just wanna say kind of as an aside, that one of the things that we're doing at Turi is reaching out and looking for opportunities to link toxics use reduction planning to the more globally um, available uh, term of alternatives assessment to, to, to help folks who are not in Massachusetts see that a TUR planner has expertise in alternatives assessment. So that's a, kind of an ongoing thing. Um, so we have the conference happening now, as you know, in December, we're gonna be doing an on-site demonstration of the um, vacuum cycling nucleation technology. We have a, a demo unit in our lab. And so it's a, it's a small room, so space will be limited. Um, and we hope to be posting the registration for that soon. Um, we are going to be doing an RC planner certification course. Um, hopefully that will be happening in um, winter and it will be online. We hope to do some additional technology demonstrations. Um, so that's, it's just kind of a stay tuned. And then of course our in-person spring conference will be happening in April and we have yet to select the location and dates. Um, but again, stay tuned to our calendar. Um, and of course you'll be getting emails from us once things are set. That's it. Thanks, Pam. And before I turn this over to uh, Carrie Sesportis again, I just want to say it's uh, wise to sign up for both Turi and OTA's newsletters because, if, for example, if you don't happen to be on DEP's new, uh, list, you'll get ours. And there's a lot of other program information that comes through there. So take it away, Carrie. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, so for OTA's update, I'll just give a brief update on the topics that are listed on this slide. So I'll touch on our technical assistance um, and just review what we can offer companies that are looking for help, especially in identifying sources of PFAS. And I'll talk a little bit about our PFAS surveys that we've been rolling out um, and also describe our ongoing collaboration with wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and I'll close out with an update on our environmental justice work. So if you have questions, please do join us for our breakout session where we can address them. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, so 
in case you're not familiar with OTA, um, just as a review, we're a non-regulatory agency and we sit under EEA, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, we provide free and confidential technical assistance to Massachusetts businesses to help them reduce the use of toxic chemicals. And also uh, we help companies with energy and water um, resource conservation. Um, our technical staff conduct site visits and facilities, and we provide concrete recommendations. Um, in, in Just in talking with our, our technical staff um, in working in the field recently, um, most of uh, the requests that we're getting, the recent requests, have been related to companies asking us for assistance, um, mainly in relation to compliance with environmental regulations, so hazardous waste management, parts of air regulations, but that being said, um, we're rolling out a lot of resources and conducting outreach to facilities regarding PFAS, and we do hope to generate referrals um, for us to provide technical assistance regarding PFAS. And I should also mention the upcoming NUMOA conference, um, the PFAS conference in the spring of 2024, and OTA is on the steering committee for that conference, so hopefully folks will attend. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so if you attended the previous session, um, you've already seen this slide, which was presented by my colleague, Jack Illingworth. Um, so OTA has been actively developing tools and resources mm -hmm. and strategies to help terra filers and manufacturers, like I said, reduce their use of PFAS. Um, this slide outlines the processes that OTA staff use. It also has live links to terra program resources, so anyone can access these and use these on their own. Um, our technical assistance staff is available to help companies look for the common uses of PFAS, some of which we learned about at the last session. Um, we'll check cast numbers against TURA reportable PFAS and also walk through um, a survey to inventory potential PFAS sor sources. And Jack also talked about um, one, of, one of those surveys uh, and did a demo. So um, just to reiterate, we're asking for any discovered PFAS products to be shared with OTA in the Tura program so we can um, develop product lists um, and guides so that we can then help others um, in the industry with PFAS source reduction. Um, and also, as I referred to earlier, um, OTA has updated the supplier notification letter with the elimination of the de minimis exemption. Um, that link is on this slide, and I also put a link earlier in the chat. Um, so just to summarize, the, the new EPA regulations are adopted for reporting year 2024. Um, EPA has removed the availability of the de minimis exemption for the purposes of supplier notification requirements for those chemicals on the TRI list that are chemicals of special concern. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this, again, is is review of um, what my colleague Jack was talking about before. So OTA has uh, developed PFAS identification surveys. We've rolled out the metal finishing survey in the paper industry. Um, and so earlier at the session today, Jack walked through a demo of the paper survey. Um, again, these surveys are completely confidential for companies, and only OTA staff will have access to the names of the companies that have completed the survey, but they're otherwise anonymized and um, given a number. Um, so regarding the metal finishing survey, we've um, OTA has identified 31 metal finishers in Massachusetts, and we've used lists from EPA and certain wastewater treatment facilities. Um, we've had uh, eight completed surveys to date. Um, and this year we've um, uh, conducted outreach at uh, several conferences um, uh, with the Upper Blackstone Clean Water Wastewater Treatment Facility and NUWEA, Contaminants of Emergency Concern for Plant Operators. So we're trying to get the word out about these surveys. Um, so as Jack mentioned, um, rather than just send a link to the survey or send a form for companies to complete, we've found that it's a lot more productive um, for companies that are participating um, to, go through OT to, to go through the survey with OTA technical staff. Um, and if companies have cast numbers ahead of time or even during the survey, we could cross-reference that with existing lists. Um, and if companies know what products they're using, we can help do some legwork to see if those products contain PFAS. So again, we continue to ask you to reach out uh, for PFAS assistance as we're developing these tools. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this, again, briefly, OTA is continuing to develop and strengthen our relationships with wastewater treatment facilities. Um, they are requiring significant up, um, industrial users upstream, or significant, excuse me, significant industrial users, SIUs, to monitor for certain PFAS. Um, and so what we've done with wastewater treatment facilities is um, we've encouraged them to introduce OTA to upstream manufacturers that fall within the tariff set codes um, that could be potential PFAS users. Um, and OTA can follow up with these manufacturers and um, we can certainly provide all the resources we just outlined, including um, uh, site visits and technical assistance. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to segue to environmental justice, and OTA has been doing a lot of work in this arena as it's a uh, priority for EEA um, and all of the agencies that sit under EEA. Um, so one exciting update that we have is that there was a vote by the Tour Administrative Council uh, um, back in August to approve a new environmental justice seat on the advisory committee. Um, so OTA is right now actively seeking candidates. Um, and so it, adding environmental justice seats to boards and committees is one of um, o OTA's key agency commitments in um, the overall EEA environmental justice strategy. Um, and we've also submitted revisions or response to comments on our key agency um, actions, which is part of the overall EEA um, strategy, which we're waiting uh, release, um, probably released by the Secretariat of the final EJ strategy by the end of 2023. So stay tuned for that. Um, OT has also been asked to sit on an advisory committee for an EPA funded grant, which was recently received from the Mystic River Watershed Association. Um, it's called ACRES, which is Advancing Community Resilience to the Cumulative Climate Impacts in the Mystic River Watershed. Um, so this grant aims to investigate the effects of combined chemical and also climate hazards in the watershed and identify strategies that can help build resilience in the communities that make up the Mystic River Watershed, um, particularly environmental justice populations. Um, and this year, OTA staff have been uh, busy conducting presentations and providing resources regarding toxics use and chemical safety, environmental justice, and climate resilience. Um, and OTA is developing static and interactive maps, um, including an ArcGIS story map, um, which will illustrate the history of redlining um, and the disproportionate distribution of facilities that use or release toxic chemicals in or near EJ neighborhoods, and we hope to be launching that soon. Um, and OTA has um, also dedicated funding for a new environmental justice internship position. Um, so a lot of news there on the EJ front. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the story map that OTA is working on, and we hope to release this very soon. Um, the screenshot shows how the story map is organized and designed. Um, it begins with information about the TUR program, and then we jump into the historical context of the practice of redlining, um, which really set the pattern in the 20th century of mortgage lending and zoning practices, which then led to persistent injustices that we see today. And the siting of facilities that use toxic chemicals um, that are in close proximity to communities of color and low-income communities. Um, so today, most of these, or many of these neighborhoods are designated as environmental justice populations by the state. Um, and so what we do in this story map is um, go into a brief overview of, um, we superimpose these historical red lines um, in current environmental justice neighborhoods geographically on the same, same story map. Um, and then we go into a brief overview of um, climate change, chemical safety, and extreme heat and flooding, just to over um, demonstrate the overlap of environmental justice and climate justice. Um, so now I'll pass the slides over to DEP to provide an update. Sounds Thanks, good. And just, a just a reminder that there was a lot of interest from all the planners in the past on the environmental justice thing. So if you join their breakout group afterwards, you can get some more information. Okay, um, I guess that's me. So Rebecca. hi, yep, hi everyone. My name is Rebecca Dolan. I'm an environmental analyst um, doing compliance and enforcement for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection or MassDEP. 
Um, we are in the, in the Torah program are located at 100 Cambridge Street in Boston. Um, and there are regional offices that do have inspectors that are um, in Torah inspectors. But Mass DEP, I'm sure you know, promulgates regulations based on environmental legislation, and we issue policies and procedures to support those regulations. Um, we inspect regulated facilities to ensure regulatory compliance and issue enforcement for non-compliance. We provide outreach and education on regulatory programs. We certify TERP planners, and we evaluate program success and provide analysis for program improvements. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to actually talk about some of the recent Mass DEP enforcement actions since I started, um, and that covers reporting years 2019 through 2022. Um, since I started in May of last year, we the department's issued two reporting penalty assessment notices, or RPANs, um, to facilities. We've issued 43 notices of noncompliance, NONS, and eight warning letters to, um, to facilities. And then we've uh, sent an additional five NONS to TER planners. Uh, next slide, please. So enforcement that we've sent out um, have been for a variety of violations. Those include failure to file um, your annual report, missing chemicals, failure to respond to QAQC requests, missing or incomplete plan summaries, improper certifications, which we kind of broke out into uh, a smaller subset of missing TER planner certifications, failure to hire an active TER planner, hiring a TER planner not certified to sign the type of plan completed by the facility, signing a TER plan when a planner's certification had expired, or signing for a plan type that the TER planner is not certified for. Um, also important to note that the Mass DEP has restarted the TER audit program, and any facility that's being audited would receive a request for information or an RFI for their plan, and you can send it to us either via mail or electronically. That's your preference, and audits now include an on-site inspection portion. Um, next slide, please. We have some reminders for everyone for the upcoming year. As I'm sure everyone is already aware, reporting year 2023 is a planning year. Um, as a reminder, it is... Oops, Actually, it's 2024, right? Uh, yes. Well, it's it's <laughs> filing. It's because right. the packet it's doesn't let you split time. it. It's the reporting <laughs> year packet, but it is planning year. Yeah, 2024. Correct. It's confusing for anyone that's filling out a packet that doesn't split between the years. So right. sorry about that, guys. Um, the most important reminder, file on time. Um, late filings are subject to an administrative penalty, and I'm sure everyone would like to avoid that. Um, as a reminder, because this upcoming year is a planning year, you need to file both the TER reporting packet and the TER planner certification packet found in EDEP. There's a screenshot of what those two look like. Um, and if you have questions when you're filing, you can contact Mass DEP at the tura.program at mass.gov. That is a, um, a generic mailbox that's manned by all three of us, uh, Lynn, Walter, and myself, all, I believe, have access. And um, that helps if somebody's on vacation, your answer doesn't go um, unanswered sitting in a generic mailbox or a specific mailbox. Next slide, please. So I have some additional reminders. If you filed an RC plan in the prior planning cycle, so 2021 slash 22, depending, um, be sure that you file both an RC plan progress report and the traditional TER plan. Um, TER planners should check their certification statuses. Um, you do receive from Walter when you get your planner certification, the, the letter that'll tell you when your certification expires and what type of plans are able to certify. So double check those. Um, you can also check those in the um, Mass DEP portal for that. And um, I do believe we post an updated list for ge um, general practice planners. We don't do the limiteds. Um, okay, Sh should also notify companies that if you are a, um, a consultant, if notify companies what types of plans you're certified to sign, make sure that agrees with what they're planning on filing for the upcoming year. If you make a mistake on your filing, be sure to amend the report. And this is important for everybody. Please note, amends can only be initiated by the user who is the transaction owner. So somebody who created the initial transaction. 
You should discuss with facilities that you work with and make sure that if you as a consultant create the initial transaction, that the facility knows they're not able to make an amend on the report without having you share the ownership of the transaction with them. Um, when we do outreach for any um, potential non-compliance, we send the outreach to the authorized signer listed on the toxic use fee worksheet. So make sure that authorized signer knows what to do if they receive outreach from MassDEP, whether it is if there's something they handle internally on their own or if they send out to a consultant. Um, it's easier if they are aware of what they should do to avoid any um, miscommunications that could result in enforcement. Ask them if you can that they update their phone numbers or phone trees for a facility because if we cannot reach them via email, we do call them. Um, and if the authorized signer has left the company, notify the Tura program and we can work with you to get that sorted out. Be sure to utilize the most updated versions of the Tura chemical list. New chemicals are added to the list on an annual basis. And um, for instance, we just had a presentation about PFAS. There are going to be some PFAS chemicals that are reportable um, under their own CAS numbers this year, as opposed to last year when they were reportable as a chemical category. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pass off to Lynn Kane to talk about some data analysis. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, um, I'm Lynn Kane from MassDP, and um, the I'm going to be discussing the uh, 2021 Terra information uh, release. Um, the it was published in uh, July of 2023. Um, this data release and former data releases can be found on Mass DEP's website, along with data extracts from 2021 and previous years. Um, this map represents the locations of the 2021 Tura filers by, Tura, by total use. Uh, the 2007 core um, is a group of chemicals and sectors that were required for reporting in 2007 through 2021. Um, for example, chemicals added to the Tura chemical list after 2007 are not included in the 2007 core. Production adjusted means that the data is normalized to account for changes in production over time. Uh, we have reported two bars of total use in the production adjusted total use chart uh, because there was a very large toxics user that ceased manufacturing in 2015. We provided total use trends with and without that filer. So the 20, 2007 core group adjusted for production from 2007 to 2021 decreased uh, total use by 62%, byproduct by 41%, and on-site on releases by 76%. Uh, the total tur the Tura data can also be found on Turi's website under Tura data online tool and dashboard. Uh, now, Heather Tenney will discuss some very preliminary results of the Tura PFAS data. All right, so, uh, so Liz, did you want to say something? Nope. Um, as you guys all know, 2022 was the first reporting year for the certain PFAS NOL category. Uh, we received those reports in July of 2023, and this is just a very preliminary uh, look at what we received. Uh, the number of files that we have received are, are still in the single digits. Uh, this is um, nearly 4 million pounds worth of use and um, about 10,000 pounds worth of releases. Uh, as you can see, fire suppression is the biggest use that we've seen so far and is the second biggest release. And um, the rubber sector, um, is the second biggest use uh, while membranes actually has the highest amount of releases. So again, this is pretty preliminary um, information, but it's the first um, year of reporting for the CERN PFAS NOL category. We have not received any reports um, for the TRI PFAS chemicals in Massachusetts as of yet. Um, and um, what else did I wanna add? I did wanna add that, you know, for the first reporting year for a particular chemical, you don't tend to get everyone. And we'll kind of, I think we'll see these numbers um, trickle in and increase um, as, as time goes on. 
Yeah, and as they do their alternative plan for PFAS and they discover things. Yes. Thanks, Heather. Um, so just one more uh, quick note, which is that there are opportunities for uh, new positions. So MassDEP has a, a, an environmental analyst three PFAS position. And just a quick note, if you know someone or who wants to apply for that, they do a priority review period, which ends tomorrow. Um, and that's uh, so that's a great opportunity. Turi is hiring a policy analyst and the job description link is here and we would love to hear from you if you're interested. Um, and NUMOA, our sister agency that is the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association that coordinates the Northeast states around a lot of things, including pollution prevention. Um, they have some positions posted and so we just wanted to let you know about that as well. Um, so, We've gone a little bit over Pam, apologies, but uh, the contact information is here in the presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Pam to, to uh, see if she can send us off to different rooms. Yes, I we have three breakout rooms that I'm gonna open up in just a second. Please choose who you wanna talk to. This is an opportunity to ask questions, hear what other people's questions are. Um, so I really encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm gonna open up the rooms and uh, we're not going to come back together at the end um, program staff. I think we can come back together, but you, you can all, you know, listen in and then move on as you'd like. All right. Good to see you all. And please go for it. Join whichever um, program room you'd like to join. DEP, OTA, or Turi. Program staff, go to your, your respective um, organizations. And if you're having trouble figuring out how to do that, then uh, speak up verbally, unmute yourself. Right, I can help with that. I, um, everyone else, if you could all go to your rooms, including you, Liz, I think you want to be there. I will go to my room, Pam. Go to your room, young lady. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I will move you. Um, okay. So let's see, um, Tiffany, you want to go to the OTA one, is that right? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so anybody else who would like Liz, some assistance, Liz, let me know. Kurt here. Kurt, where would you like to go? Wherever you want to put me. No, tell me where you want to go. Yeah. Uh, what are my three choices to get? Oh, DEP, OTA, or Turi? OTA, please. Okay. Can you put me in the DEP room, can, uh, Pam? Yes, I, yes, I you. can. Thank you. Thanks. Can you put um, me in the OTA room? Yeah, except for oh. I just sent you to DEP for some reason. Let me. Oh. <laughs> who, who said that? Wait. Yeah, that who said Joan Shaughnessy. Joan wants to go to OTA. Yeah. Okay, Lucy, you want to go where? I want to go to Churi. Churi. All right, and I think I sent you to the wrong place by accident. You did. I, you I, I didn't accept it. Churi. Okay, good. Um, cool. How do you? Can you? How do you, uh, you before you sent out a list, where did you set, where do you see the list to choose? Just tell me where you want to go. It's oh, DEP, okay. OTA, or Turi. Turi. Okay, good choice. All right. Thank you. Who else needs some assistance with this? Yes, hi, Pam. This is in um, Turi, please. Okay. Who else? Tony, uh, can I go to OTA? Yes, you can. Let me move you over there. Who else? Robert, Jason, Antonio. Gabrielle, go to the tray one, please. Here, I'll just move you there. Um, Chris, David, Jason, where would you like to go? Speak up, please. Bethany. DEP. That's you, David? Yep. Off you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Who else? Chris, where would you like to go? Mr. Capalbo? Oh. Robert, where would you like to go? Uh, the OTA. OTA it is. Bethany, where can I send you? Bethany and Chris Capelbo, you guys there? All right, thanks, Stephen. 